Hi, this is Tom. Welcome to the Tales of Mistara podcast. I'd like to start by saying thanks for giving my podcast a shot. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen, especially with the wealth of Dungeons & Dragons related content out there. My hope is that I can provide something a little bit different here, that will set this aside from the other podcasts. If you stick with it and you enjoy it, then I have achieved what I set out to do, to entertain, tell a story, immerse an audience and share my love of D&D. Once again, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's get on with the show. The following podcast is for mature audience and contains detailed descriptions of violence. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Tales of Mistara podcast, an experimental podcast that mixes traditional storytelling with old school pen and paper role playing games played entirely solo. This could be considered a dark fantasy novel or a solo Dungeons and Dragons campaign. If treated like a novel, then nothing can be assumed, only the dice can determine the outcome. cannot be known whether a character will live or die. Nothing is precious. No one is safe from the roll of the dice. If treated like a tabletop role-playing game, there are no players. There is no dungeon master. There is only me, the rules, and the dice. In ancient times, the land now called Karimikos was the forest homeland of the Traldar, men and women so favoured by the immortals and allowed to live in these beautiful lands. The Song of King Halav. This is an ancient work maintained by generations of bards before finally being committed to writing about six centuries ago. Tom again here, and another welcome to the Tales of Mistara podcast. This is episode one, so I would like to spend some time discussing the game mechanics I will use to produce this podcast. This podcast is new, however, I had the same idea some time ago and began to record an episode, but for whatever reason, life just got in the way, and I never came back to it. My aim was and still is to immerse myself and others in the fantasy world of D&D and create a unique and rewarding experience that does justice to the spirit and aesthetic of the game. My inspiration to make this type of podcast was reignited when I discovered the Tale of the Manticore podcast, which is along the same lines as this one, although this one has some differences. I will be using old school rules, but I will implement the Mensa D&D basic rule set, published in 1983, and I will be setting my campaign world in a published setting, namely the world of Mistara. I will also be incorporating published adventure modules and will be sticking as strictly as possible to the original rule set. I will not know what will happen in the story ahead of it actually happening. The dice will be making most of the decisions and will ultimately dictate where the story goes. In regards to the rule set, Mensa Basic, this is sometimes referred to as the BECMI rule set because it was released in five box sets, Basic, Expert, Companion, Master and Immortal. Each box set adding further rules and character levels to the game. I find it a perfect rule set for solo play, but to avoid digression, we won't discuss that now. Let's just get on with it. First, I will roll a party of completely random characters using the BECMI rule set. Here goes. 
I will start with the ability scores. Once rolled, if the highest score is less than 9, then it's a re-roll. And if two or more scores are less than 6, then that's also a re-roll. Let's begin. Character 1. Strength. Rolling 3d6. 11. Intelligence. 12. Wisdom. 15. That's a plus one bonus. Dexterity. 11. Constitution. 8. Minus one penalty. Charisma. 11. This character would make a suitable cleric and gets 1d6 hit point dice with a minus one penalty due to low constitution. Rolling for hit points. 5 minus 1 equals 4 hit points. Now let's roll up character 2. Strength. 8 minus 1 penalty. Intelligence. 12. Wisdom. 10. Dexterity. 8 minus 1 penalty. Constitution. 13. Plus 1 bonus. Charisma. 8 minus 1 penalty. This character will make a very average magic user, but the constitution bonus will hopefully keep the character alive long enough to become powerful. Rolling for hit points. 1d4 plus 1. 4. Phew. Character 3. Strength. 11. Intelligence. 7. Minus 1 penalty. Wisdom. 13. Plus 1 bonus. Dexterity. 13. Plus 1 bonus. Constitution. 10. Charisma. 9. I will use the ability score exchange method described in the player's manual to lower wisdom to 9 and raise strength to 13. Now this character will make a good halfling. Rolling hit points, 1d6. 5 hit points. Character 4. Strength. 17. Plus 2 bonus. Intelligence. 11. Wisdom. 11. Dexterity. 9. Constitution. 10. Charisma. 15. Plus one bonus. This character will make a well-rounded fighter and has a very good strength score. I'll roll 1d8 for hit points. Four hit points. Last character, character five, strength. Six, minus one penalty. Intelligence. 13, plus one bonus. Wisdom. 10. Dexterity. 13. Plus 1 bonus. Constitution. 10. Charisma. 9. This will be our thief who gets 1d4 hit points. I rolled a 1 at first. But as advised in the Dungeon Master's rulebook, a 1 or a 2 might best be re-rolled. Rolling again. I got a 4. Our thief has 4 hit points. And thus we have our party of adventurers. Claudius Tagaris a human cleric who resides from a wealthy but untitled Thyatian family from the city of Kelvin. 
He wants to be a member of the Order of the Griffin, a military order of the church in Karamikos. He has four hit points. Theodore Ivanos, a human magic user from a penniless background. He is a Traladaran and comes from a homestead near Radleb Woods and wants to establish a wizard's tower there. He has four hit points. Elmo Greentop, a halfling from a comfortable background. He resides in the logging community of Threshold after emigrating from the five shires. He has five hit points. Ilyena Petraeus, a human fighter from a comfortable Traladaran family residing in Selescu village, following what is known as the shearing ceremony. When she turned 17 years old, Ilyena insisted she take part. Even though the shearing is strictly for males in most cases, she left her family to live apart and take part in respectable adventures. As is customary, she has four hit points. Yolanda Vorloy, a human thief from a very wealthy and titled family, members of the Vorloy clan of Specularum. Yolanda has ties with the Kingdom of Thieves, a close-knit society of burglars. She has four hit points. Now we have populated the world with some characters. Let us begin our adventure. Our adventure begins in the town of Threshold, a logging community of around 5,000. Though small, it's a decent place to live and is not as rustic as most communities of similar size. Threshold is ably ruled by Sherlain Halloran, Baron and Patriarch of the Church. Many years ago, this part of the realm of man was ruled by a magic user named Gygar, a man of great and mysterious powers. He ruled the lands from his mighty castle Mistermere, located at the foot of the mountains to the north. Gygar died after a long and peaceful rule, but no successor was named. Over the years, the unclaimed castle fell into ruins. Now, centuries later, the outline of the broken towers can still be seen from the town of Threshold, ever beckoning to seekers of danger, fame and fortune. Claudius Tagaris, a novice cleric just arrived from the city of Kelvin. His mission is clear. Alina Halloran, a member of the Order of the Griffin, a military order of the church in Karamikos, is dead. She was a fellow cleric, adventurer, and a protector of Threshold. The town rulers have offered a reward of 1,000 gold pieces for the capture of her killer, Bargle, the renegade magic user. A deed like that will help Claudius in his ambitions to join the Order of the Griffin. You have heard the tales told by others, tales of monsters lurking in the ruins and guarding rich treasures. Claudius says across the dinner table of the Golden Dragon Inn. Yolanda Vorloy, the thief, and Theodore Ivanos, the magic user, glanced at one another and nodded in response to the cleric. I want to try my luck in the castle ruin, Yolanda says. Being at the centre of town, the inn is busy, filled with ruddy-faced townsfolk, and other adventurers who are eating, drinking, laughing, and having a splendid time. Nearby, Ilyena Petraeus, instead of serving tables, listens intently. This is a perfect opportunity. She left Selescu village after volunteering herself for the sharing ceremony on her 17th birthday. The custom is to leave your family in search of adventure. All she found was employment at the Golden Dragon Inn. That was two years ago. Ilyena pulls her colleague and best friend over to the table. We also want to try our luck, she says to Claudius. 
Yolanda and Fyodor glance up in astonishment. We do, Elmo Greentop, Ilyana's halfling friend says in a confused tone. My friend is strong, quick and handy with an axe, Ilyana says. And I am stronger still and skilled with a sword and all manner of weapons. After a pause, the companions at the dinner table simply shrug. We meet at dawn for the short journey, Claudius says. It's morning and the party set off to the castle. It lies only three miles from town, just a healthy walk past the local farmer's fields. As they follow the dirt roads past the farm, they greet the workers tending the crops. It's a lovely summer's day and all seems peaceful. The landowner himself sits atop a wagon watching his men and chats with the party idly before they continue onward. After bidding him a good day, the party continue toward the ruin. As they approach, they see that the walls are jagged and full of small holes and a few large stone blocks have tumbled to the earth, laying scattered around the ruins. A gateway in the centre of the front wall stands empty, and the massive outer doors now lay rotting nearby. This gateway seems to be the easiest entrance through the wall. A ten foot wide gaping hole is in the wall off to the party's left and could be another entrance. The party do not see any other entrances. The rest of the wall is crumbling, but few wide holes have opened. This outer area has no other interesting features, a sheer cliff the face of a mountain rises at the north edge of the ruins. The walk from town took about one hour and the time is now 8am. The path through the rubble passes the fallen door. As the party carefully approach, they notice some slight movement beneath it. This is the end of my introduction narrative. Now the dice will take over and the adventure will truly begin. I will decide on the party's marching order at this point. Ilyana will go up front, as she has a good armour class and a high strength. Claudius also has a good armour class, so will take the back in case any danger comes from behind. Yolanda and Elmo will march second in line, and Fyodor behind them. Ilyana moves forward to examine the door to ensure their path will be safe. The rest of the party keep watch for other dangers. Suddenly, the ground along one edge moves and a hole appears. There is something under the door. Claudius readies his sling, so does Elmo and Yolanda pulls her short bow off her back. Ilyana draws her sword as she continues towards the rotting door. Suddenly, a large worm-like monster sticks its head out of a hole under the door. It has eight long tentacles in a circle around its mouth. It doesn't come out all the way, just far enough to attack Ilyana. Rolling initiative. The party, 1d6. 6. The creature, 1d6. 4. The party can move or attack first. Claudius, Yolanda and Elmo move around for a clear shot on the creature to avoid hitting Ilyana. They will fire next round. Ilyana attacks with her sword, rolling 1d20 plus 2. 6. Against the creature's armour class of 7, a 12 is needed to hit, so it's a miss. The creature attacks with all 8 of its tentacles, rolling 8d20 against Ilyana's armour class of 2. 
the creature needs a 14 to hit. Three hits. Ilyana must make three saving throws versus Paralysis. She needs a 14 or higher to save. Rolling 3d20. Two fails. Ilyana falls over, paralysed. The party see her fall and do not know whether she is alive or dead. Second round of combat. Claudius, Elmo and Yolanda will fire at the creature. Rolling initiative for round two. The party, 1d6. Two. The creature, 1d6. Five. The creature crawls out of its hole and moves towards Claudius, who stands nearest. The party fire their missile weapons. Yolanda looses an arrow from her short bow. The creature is at medium range, rolling 1d20. It's a 16, plus 1 for Yolanda's dexterity bonus, so 17. And a 12 is needed to hit. Rolling damage, 1d6 for an arrow for a short or long bow. 1 damage. The creature had 10 hit points. It now has 9. Elmo fires a stone from his sling, rolling 1d20. A hit without modifiers. Damage roll, 1d4. 1 damage. Now Claudius' sling stone. 1d20. It's a 2, a definite miss. The party will all attempt missile fire again next round. Rolling initiative for round 3. Party. 1. Creature. 2. The creature makes 8 attacks against Claudius after closing the gap. 8d20. Claudius's AC is 2, so 14 is needed. 3 hits. Rolling 3d20 for saving throws. Claudius needs a 14 to save, so that's 2 saves and 1 fail. Claudius falls to the ground. He cannot move. Elmo and Yolanda fire again. Yolanda's short bow, 1d20 plus 1, now the creature is at short range. 15 plus 1 equals 16, definite hit, 1d6 damage. 4 damage, the creature has 4 hit points left. Elmo's sling, 1d20 plus 1, now the creature is at short range and plus one due to Elmo being a halfling. He gets a plus one bonus to missile fire attack rolls. He rolls a 17 hit, rolling 1d4 damage. One damage, ugh. On the next round, Theodore will move to a safe distance. Elmo will move and strike the creature with his axe. Yolanda will draw her sword and attack as well. Rolling initiative for round four. Party. Four. Creature. Four. All actions will take place at the same time. The creature will attack both Yolanda and Elmo using four tentacles each. So, Yolanda strikes with her sword. 1d20 minus one for her strength penalty. 3 minus 1 equals 2, definitely a miss. Elmo strikes with his axe, 1d20. Another miss. 4 tentacles at Yolanda. 7, 8, 9, 18. Her AC is 6. The creature needed a 10 to hit, so 1 hit. 1 saving throw to make. She needs a 13. Rolling her save. It's an 18. Four tentacles at Elmo. Four, 12, 15, 18. His AC is five. The creature needed an 11 to hit, 
So three hits, three saving throws to make. He needs a 13, rolling his saves. 20, four, two. Two fails, Elmo falls to the ground. Round five, Yolanda will attack and finish off the creature. Theodore, having no real choice, will cast a magic missile, his only available memorized spell. Full rest will be needed before it can be memorized again. Initiative rolls, party. Three, creature. Three, the action will all take place at the same time once again. The creature will attack Yolanda with all eight tentacles. Theodore creates a glowing arrow which appears next to him. It hovers there for a split second before it is shot at the creature, inflicting 1d6 plus 1 damage. 4 damage. The spell kills the creature, but as action is simultaneous this round, I still need to roll 8 attacks against Yolanda. 8d20, needing 10 to hit. 4 hits. 4 saving throws needing 13. Only one save. Yolanda is now also paralysed, leaving only Theodore. The carrion crawler slumps to the ground, motionless. Looking at the dead creature, Theodore sees that it is about nine feet long and has many small legs like a centipede. He has heard talk of such a creature back in town. They call it a carrion crawler. He peers into the hall under the door to see if any others are still hiding there. With the body out of the way, he sees clearly a pile of coins at the bottom of the hall, about eight feet down. Theodore decides to check on the rest of the party first. With an average amount of intelligence and wisdom, I will rule that Theodore easily discovers that the rest of the party are not dead, but paralysed. He waits three full turns, about half an hour, until the party fully recover from the effects of the paralysis. You are all close to being eaten, Theodore tells them. There is something down that hole. Let me check for traps first. Yolanda says. You have been listening to the Tales of Mistara podcast. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed this episode. If you have listened on YouTube, then I would appreciate you taking the time to subscribe, click the like button, and let me know your thoughts in a comment. If you have listened on iTunes, then I would appreciate it if you would leave a five-star review. These things really help, and they let me know that the work I put into this podcast is worth it, and that I am making content that people like. After all, that's why I'm doing this. Once again, thanks for listening. I'll see you next session.